Okay, good. Very good. Uh, we have a translator uh, who will be translating uh, or trying to keep up with me at least. I have a tendency to talk rather quickly. So as we're going through today, if I'm talking too fast, just raise your hand. I'll stop. I'll go back and I'll re-explain everything. That's fine. Oh, look, there's me. Um, my name is Nicholas Whitaker. I'm on a team called the Google for Media team. And uh, really, our entire job is traveling around the world training journalists on all of the various tools that Google has uh, that's useful for journalism. Uh, so that goes across a wide range of different topics, including Google Search, uh, which is what we're here to talk about this morning, uh, Google Trends, uh, which you may have seen before. Uh, who here has done a Google Search before? Okay, a few of you. Very good. Uh, so that's a good place to start. Uh, who here has searched for an image online before? Who here has searched for a copyright free image to use online before? More hands should be up. Okay. Uh, we'll also be talking about a tool called Google Public Data as well. Has anybody seen Google Public Data? One? All right. Um, we'll be talking about a wide range of different products. And if we could actually switch over to my uh, presentation instead of the back of my head. Where's my AV guy? There it is. Uh, we'll be talking, oh, to go back. This is me, uh, Nicholas Whitaker. Uh, if you are interested in getting in touch with us, our email address, mediatools at google.com. Uh, that's the easiest email to use to get a hold of uh, our team. Uh, depending on where we're at in the world, we're in various different time zones at any given time. Uh, but this email goes out to me, it goes out to my colleague Vanessa Schneider, who focuses more on Google Maps and Google Earth, uh, as well as my colleague Daniel Seberg. So uh, I, I think a lot of times uh, there's a nasty rumor that you can't get a hold of somebody uh, at Google. Uh, and I just want to dispel that rumor right now. This email is for you as journalists, so if you have questions, uh, if you're working with one of our tools and you want to share uh, your content with us and let us know uh, what you're working on or if you just want to get some feedback or if you just want to say hello, uh, you can reach out to us at that email. Uh, also, my personal email, if you have questions about this presentation today or, again, if you just want to say hi, uh, you can email me at nwhitaker at google.com. Uh, also, if you're on Google+, Plus, who here has a Google Plus account? All right. Uh, you can add me to your circles on Google+. Plus. It's plus Nicholas Whitaker. I think I'm the only Nicholas Whitaker on there. And if you're on that other social media uh, network, uh, Twitter, uh, you can actually add me there as well. I post quite a bit about journalism, about new media technology, a little bit about cats. Uh, so if you're interested in following me on that, you can check me out on Twitter as well. We also have a website, google.com slash media tools. And what the website is, is an educational resource that we've created for journalists. And um, really the idea behind this is providing as much information in one location for you. Uh, something that we found uh, time and time again when you go to different websites at Google, depending on the product, uh, there's like 30 different websites in order to find information about like one or two different things. So we put all of the information in one location for you. Um, we're also about to go through version two of the website. So if you have suggestions or if you have, um, <laughs> if you have suggestions or if you have uh, things that you would like to have added to the website, now would be a very perfect time to add those suggestions in. And just if you have suggestions, send us an email at mediatools at google.com. I'd also like to mention as well that that website, we've just recently translated that into 46 different languages. So if English is not your first language, uh, you can also see it in Italian. So today what we're going to be going over in a very kind of abbreviated way, uh, typically these presentations take about two and a half to three hours. Uh, so we're going to be learning an enormous amount of information in a very short period of time. So as you're walking out of this presentation, if you're like, oh, my brain is completely full of information, that's a good thing. Um, I'll also be handing out information afterwards. And by handing out, I mean emailing. Uh, I have uh, a bunch of uh, URLs. Uh, anything that we talk about in the presentation today, any of the URLs, any of the links, uh, I'll be sending that out afterwards as a PDF document. Uh, I'll also be handing out an enormous amount of homework uh, for you as well. So if you have nothing else to do for the rest of the week, uh, I have you covered. It's okay. Um, 
the easiest way to get a hold of that, if you're interested in getting those uh, additional resources, is using that email address, mediatools at google.com, to say, hey, I met you at the uh, journalism festival in Perugia. You did an amazing job. You're an absolutely fantastic presenter. And I'd be more than happy to take that homework from you, and I'll send that to you. Uh, the first part of the day today, we're going to be talking about these uh, tools right here. In the second part of the day, uh, there's a second workshop. Um, I think it's around 3 o'clock, actually, or 4 o'clock. Uh, we'll be talking about Hangouts on Air and YouTube and how you can use that as a journalist uh, to reach your audiences and kind of amplify your signal. Uh, so definitely check that out as well. For those of you who have done a Google search before, who here remembers 1998? Somewhat? Mostly? Yeah. It's a little fuzzy. There we go. Over here on the left-hand side, this is what it looked like back in 1998 if you did a search on Google. And if you have a computer right now or if you have a tablet or a mobile device, you can actually follow along a lot of what we're talking about uh, during the presentation. So if you type into a search bar, Google in 1998, it'll actually show you what it looked like back then. Uh, we also had an exclamation mark in our logo. We were very, very excited about what we were doing back in 1998. Um, we've calmed down a little bit since then. Uh, we got rid of that exclamation point, and we've actually added in an enormous amount of additional information uh, to make it easier for you to get uh, results back from a Google search. Now, the idea behind the uh, knowledge graph over here on the right-hand side, this is called the knowledge graph. Um, and really what the knowledge graph is, is it's a culmination of all of the various tools uh, that we have uh, put in one place. So instead of having to open up a second page for Google Maps, a second page for Google um, uh, Image Search, uh, all of this information is right here for you. So uh, if I did a search for Perugia, which is, by the way, an amazing, amazingly beautiful place, and you guys have probably been walking around as well. This is my first time here. Who, first time here? Yeah, it's great, right? Really good chocolate. Um, so if I was going to uh, be searching for an image of Perugia, uh, here it is right here being pulled from Google Images. Over here is a shot from Google Maps. Uh, down below, we have third-party content, which is being provided to give additional information or additional context about this particular topic. And if I wanted to find any more information about any one of these things, for example, the University of Perugia, uh, or Foreigner's University, or the province of Perugia, or the population, I can click on that. It's going to open up another window to give me more information about now, depending on if you're searching for a person, a place, or a thing, that knowledge graph is going to change. So if I'm searching for a person, uh, a lot of times those results down there at the bottom will actually show me other search results that people have done in relationship to that particular search. In this case, because I'm searching for a place, it's showing me points of interest. And Google's understanding what you're looking for. It's understanding what you're searching for. And again, the idea in a perfect world, if we were able to create a perfect search engine, it should understand exactly what you mean and give you back exactly what you want. This is actually a quote from one of our founders. I like to change the way he says this and, and instead say, the perfect search engine should understand exactly what you mean and give you back exactly what you need, what you need. You go online, you search for something, you're trying to fulfill a need of some sort, right? You need something, you're curious about something. You're doing research on something. Perhaps you're worried about something. Uh, so in a perfect world, it should be able to give those, back, uh, give those results back to you immediately and very accurately. Now, if you have a, a bit of an understanding about how search works, uh, today, it, you know, it's much different than 1997. Back in 1997, if you can remember back that far, if you type something into a search bar, it would take hours to search through and figure out exactly what it was that you were looking for in the first place. Nowadays, we've indexed the web. We've created some sort of a structure or organization of that. Um, there's about 570 million people, places, and things that have been indexed. It's probably quite a bit more than that by now. The slide's a few months old. Uh, and it's really those connecting uh, attributes and, de um, and connections between those people, places, and things that, that we're looking at these days. Uh, versus just the definitions of those things. And it works very much the same way that we experience the world around us. You go to a new place, you meet a new person, there's a connection that's drawn between those two things, and that's what creates meaning. So if I were to do a search, uh, within the milliseconds that I do a search and I get a result back, uh, this is what's happening behind the scenes. It's pulling from those millions or billions of different websites. It's applying different search criteria or search tools depending on what modifications I've made to that search. Uh, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a little bit. 
Um, it's also pulling from Google News, Google Images, and videos, and other updates, and it pro it's providing that all back in one location for you. So again, that you don't have to keep opening multiple different tabs. It's also uh, using feature triggers. Uh, you may have used this before. Who here has a calculator still? Is this little box you could type numbers into it? It would, it would give you a math result back. Uh, nowadays, they're actually built into our phones. So if you have, you probably have a calculator app. Um, well you can actually just type right within the search bar. Uh, a math equation. It will provide those answers directly back for you. So 2 plus 2 equals, and it will give you that back in the search bar. The same thing with weather. What is the weather in Perugia today? Well, it's beautiful. But you, know, you can ask Google what the weather is. Do I need an umbrella tomorrow? What is the weather in Rome this week? It's going to understand conversational speech and provide those answers back for you within the search results. Um, Spell check. I'm a big fan of spell check. I'm a terrible speller, so spell check helps me sound at least somewhat more intelligent when I'm writing an email uh, or doing a search. But a lot of times you'll get a result and it says, did you mean? And then it'll provide you a URL link for the correct spelling of the word you were looking for. You click on that and it provides those results back. I think it's a really great thing. Search refinements. That's really what we're going to be talking about today. What tips and tricks can you use as a professional, as a journalist, to get the most out of your experience? One of those search refinements might be quotation marks. Has anybody used quotation marks before in a search? Yeah, I think this is a really useful tool. Not a whole lot of people know about this. If you were to use quotation marks, really what you're telling Google is that everything within those quotation marks is one search query. If you type into a search bar without quotation marks, to be or not to be, what it's really looking at is to and, be and, or and, not and, to and, be. So by using quotation marks, it's removing all of those ands, and it's just looking for that one query. And it's going to show you that query within, those, um, within that specific order. Now, I would look at this tool as kind of a surgeon's scalpel. It's very, very precise. Sometimes you might use this tool and miss results that you were actually looking for in the first place. So if I was searching for Alexander Graham Bell, you guys familiar with Alexander Graham Bell? Somewhat, yeah. Alexander Graham Bell is a good search. You can look for him. Uh, if I wanted to know more information about Alexander Graham Bell, if I did a search for Alexander Bell, uh, what I might actually skip over is Alexander G. Bell or Alexander Graham Bell. So again, being very specific is sometimes not a good thing. I would try it with and without quotation marks to make sure you're getting the results that you're actually looking for. Uh, here's another example. Uh, let's say, for, uh, for example, I'm doing a search and I'm getting a lot of results back uh, about a particular topic that I don't want. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going to use the example of Malaysia. Um, let's say I wanted to find a vacation spot in Malaysia. I was actually there about six months ago. It's a beautiful place. Um, in this case, we're looking at Malaysia, MH370. Who keeps doing that? Uh, it's back in my head. Uh, keep searching for uh, Malaysia. Uh, and I want to remove results uh, that include examples of the uh, Malaysia Airlines disappearance. So what I would do is type in Malaysia minus MH370 minus 370 minus flight and minus jet. And what it will provide for me are examples of that particular search removing all instances of that Malaysia Airlines incident. Now, I just wanted to show you while we're in here. Uh, this is a Google News example for this particular uh, issue, right? And as you can see, normally if I just did a search for Malaysia and stripped this out, what's probably going to show up are examples of Malaysia Airlines right off the top. Uh, so by using those minus symbols, you're getting rid of all of those extraneous examples and really zeroing in again on exactly what it is you're looking for. Uh, another example. Uh, I just recently moved to the Midwest or the Southwest of the United States. Uh, salsa is kind of a big thing over there. Um, maybe I wanted to uh, look for salsa without tomatoes. Uh, so I could find a salsa recipe uh, without tomatoes. So this works for all kinds of things, serious and, and, and not so serious. Um, one other example, let me show this while, while we're in here as well. Again, it's, uh, there's these different triggers and different keywords that Google Search understands uh, when you're going into this particular uh, research project. Let's say, for example, I've come to this wonderful journalism festival. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the keynote presentation is. Uh, 
this festival actually has a very well-organized website. I've been to a few of them that aren't so well-organized. So if I'm trying to find the agenda, I'm trying to find where lunch is, maybe I'm trying to find where parking is, uh, I can actually use the site modifier. So site colon, then the URL for the website, and then I can add in additional keywords after that. And in this case, what it's showing me is providing me examples of uh, this particular site with examples of where it says keynote somewhere within the page. So if you're approaching a website, instead of going through and manually typing in examples and spending all of your time sifting through the entire website in order to find what you're looking for, you can let Google do a lot of the work for you because it's already indexed that website. It'll help find examples for you very quickly. Now, another tool that I would show you here is this one called Search Tools. What Search Tools allows you to do is pull up additional modifiers. So if I wanted to just find examples of this particular uh, query within the last week or within the last 24 hours, again, you can find very, very current results this way. Uh, you can also do a custom date range. So if I wanted to find results from two or three years ago or you know, 10 years ago, uh, it makes it very easy then to pull up results that way using the custom date range settings. Everybody follow me so far? Okay, great. All right, so moving on. Another example, uh, Google Advanced Search. Has anybody seen Google Advanced Search before? Yeah, a few. So I think this is one of the, um, one of the really good uh, kind of hidden gems of Google. Uh, if you can't remember all these search refinements and you just want to be able to find examples very, very quickly uh, for Google Search, uh, just type in Google Advanced Search. It'll allow you to find websites with all of these words, this exact word or phrase, which is very much like the quotation marks that we were just talking about, any of these words, none of these words, and so on. You can also search within specific languages. So if I just want to search within Italian, it makes it very easy for me to search that way. A specific region. So if I just want to find uh, websites that were uploaded from Perugia, uh, I can do that. Uh, site or domain. So if I just wanted to look within one particular website, like we were showing a minute ago, uh, within the festival website, or a particular type of website. So is it a .edu, a .gov, a .org website? Um, I can also look for, and I think this is very useful, where are the words that I'm looking for appearing on the page? Is it in the headline? Is it in the URL? Is it in the body of the text somewhere down below? So again, it helps you kind of narrow down where exactly these results are being shown from. And then also, uh, Safe Search. I think Safe Search is really f uh, a fantastic tool as well. Uh, this is really good for me when I'm doing presentations. Uh, you don't get sexually explicit images showing up on screen in the middle of a room full of people. Uh, but let's say, for example, you're sharing your, oh, let's do that later. Uh, let's say you're uh, sharing your screen with a colleague or you're sharing it with a child. You don't want sexually explicit images showing up. This is a way to lock that down for you. Now, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so that there's two different ways of go, going about doing that. So you could use advanced search and you can look at it within a particular date range. Uh, and actually, the easiest way to do that, uh, instead of using Google advanced search, uh, what I would use would be using these search tools here and then look under here for a specific date range or time. That'll narrow that down to a specific block of time and then you can use the keywords that you're looking for uh, to narrow it down further. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, if you use advanced search and the type of thing, sometimes it shows results. Is here? No? Okay. Uh, sometimes it shows results which are published earlier or later, but not in this date range. So mm. it's confusing. Why is it so? Yeah, so that probably has a lot to do with the way the website's been um, organized or the metadata that's included with that particular result. So depending on when that website was indexed or when it was updated, sometimes those sites, even though Google is looking at it and saying it's within a specific date range, that website may have been updated more recently and it might be showing up slightly different results or different parts of that page might be uh, updated at different times. So I would look at the custom date range as kind of a... Um, broad strokes or just kind of like a general uh, bucket of time. Uh, but sometimes you will get outliers uh, where a site's being kind of shown outside of that particular date range. Okay. So another thing that you can do 
uh, using a, a few different uh, search queries. One of them would be called file type. So a lot of times we're working on uh, Google search, we're looking for data. Who here is a data journalist? Infographics, data visualizations? Yeah, you'll probably, most, more hands will probably be up by the end of this uh, convention, I imagine. Um, but let's say, for example, I'm looking for a resource for uh, where to find data. Oftentimes, data is locked up in an XLS format. Uh, oftentimes, it's in a PDF format. So if I was looking for information on the population of Perugia, Italy, I could do population file type PDF. Well, first of all, what it's going to show me uh, it's going to show me a data uh, table right here within the search results. And this is being pulled from Google public data. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. It's always going to tell you down below where this particular data source came from. But then down further below that, all of these results are PDF files or formats uh, that are showing me population uh, with Perugia, Italy, somewhere within the body of that text. So again, you know, even just using search, you can use uh, keywords, you can use those trigger words like file type uh, to help search for different types of uh, documents online as opposed to just websites. And if you wanted to get even more specific, you could use Google Advanced Search like I was showing a second ago. Uh, you could narrow down those results e even further uh, and you could look for specific keywords and then file types would be right down here. So if I wanted to look for just PDFs, use file type, and I could even narrow it to see where within those files that particular term is showing up. So again, just different ways to kind of uh, approach that. Uh, another feature trigger uh, would be a hashtag. Who here uses hashtags? Yeah, a few of you. Uh, hashtags are very popular these days. It's a really good way to include uh, your information as part of a larger conversation. Uh, I was actually in Vietnam not too long ago. They don't use hashtags in Vietnam. I spent a large part of my uh, training teaching people what a hashtag was, which was really interesting. Uh, but in this case, you guys are using hashtags. Uh, if I wanted to see what the hashtag first day of spring was all about, I can type the hashtag directly within the search bar, and it's going to provide me examples of search results on Twitter for first day of spring. Uh, here's Inagist. Here is Instagram down below. Uh, you'll have Facebook. You'll have a whole different range of different social media. So you don't have to go to each individual social media uh, profile or social media um, platform. You can just search within Google and get those results back. And over on the right-hand side, if you're posting on Google+, and you're posting regularly, and you're using hashtags, and someone does a hashtag search on Google Search, those hashtags can show up over here on the right-hand side on a Google search bar. So somebody doesn't even have to be following you on Google+, Plus to be following along this larger part of a conversation. So again, as a journalist, the idea is to get as many people to read and see your articles as possible, I hope. Uh, so this is another way of just getting people to be able to find your work. So here's another example, uh, Google image search. Uh, let's say I'm looking for an image. I want to hopefully find a Creative Commons image or an image that's free to use or share. Uh, I don't want an angry photographer calling me and asking me why they're using my photo without, my per without permission. So if I use the search tools feature here, I can look within images, I can open up search tools, and it drops down this additional menu to help me narrow down my search results even further. So I can look for very large images. I can look for images in full color. I can look for photos versus, say, uh, graphics or other types of animations. Uh, I can look for with a specific date range or time range. So if I wanted to find photos from 2005 to 2007, this is a really good way of narrowing that down. Uh, if I wanted to find images that are labeled for reuse or labeled for reuse with modification, those are the two buckets that you would be looking for to make sure that you're using images that uh, are appropriate. Um, you can also uh, narrow them by specific size. So right here, it's showing me what size these images are without me even having to click on them. Now, if I clicked on one of these images, it would pull up in a new menu or a new window, and it's going to show me an example of this photo. It's going to give me a little bit more information, and there's this feature right here called Search by Image. Has anybody used Search by Image before? Yeah. Search by image is really fun. What it allows you to do is it's going to take a look at that image and it's going to say, where, are, where else on the web is this photo showing up? Or it's going to look at this image and say, where else on the internet is this image or an image that looks similar to it showing up? And you can use this in a few different ways. 
Uh, what I would think of this is, is kind of um, your image detective, right? So you're going in and you're taking a look at an image and you're finding additional information out about it. Um, you can also go and click this little button right here. It's going to take you to the exact page where that photo is located. You can also click on this button here where it says view image. It's going to open that image up in another browser window and it's going to give me the image URL up at the top. And that becomes very, very useful for you later on for a few different reasons. So let's say, for example, I wanted to search by image. Well, I could click where it says search by image on that last page here, right here. I can also go to images.google.com. Has anybody seen this little camera icon here? Has anybody ever clicked on that camera icon? It actually does something, yeah. Uh, also, this little microphone icon. If you have a mobile device, uh, it's actually available now on a uh, desktop as well. You can click the little microphone. When you have a moment, don't do it right now because it's very distracting in the middle of my presentation, but click on the microphone icon and, and just speak into the microphone in Italian or English and say, show me a photo of the world's smallest monkey. <laughs> it's worth it. It's a lot of fun. Check it out. Um, but before that, so if I wanted to click on the camera icon, it's going to open up another window right here. This is where I paste that image URL that I just found a minute ago. I can paste that directly within that search bar. It's going to look for where else that image shows up online. So who's a photographer here in the room? Who has a smartphone? You are all photographers. Yeah. Um, so if I were to search for uh, an image, if I wanted to find out where that photo is showing up online, let's say it's a photo that I took, I can chase down and find out, are people using my photos without permission? Another thing that I can do is I can find just more information about that photo in particular. So I can paste the image URL, or I can upload the image and then hit search by image. It's going to open up a new page and give me more information about that photo. So here's an example, and you guys have probably seen this before. Something goes out on social media. It's like, oh, this terrible, crazy thing is happening. Share, share, share. Everybody shares the photo around, and then a month later, it's like, oh, that was a hoax, by the way. You know. So if you look at this, Here's Robert Jordan, PhD. He should know better. So he posted this photo and he said, some Chicagoans, people who live in Chicago, won't drive away until spring. The no parking sign was put there for a reason. So I'm not, I don't mean to make fun of this, this gentleman, but if you look at this photo and you know anything about Chicago, and in fact, if you know anything about cars, you look at this and it's like something doesn't look right about this. This does not look like a, a, an SUV that would actually be in the US. Uh, also, the trees don't look quite right. There's a lot of things that are going on here. If you know anything about the boardwalk in Chicago, there's no park benches here. Uh, but if you look, Nick Hanen took this image. He uploaded this to Google Image Search. He searched for where else this image showed up online. And in fact, this image did not come from Chicago in 2014. It came from Switzerland in 2005. So as a way to vet content, before you share a photo or before you just, you know, put your stamp of approval on a particular image and share that and make that validated by your own uh, news agency. You can vet content and verify where this image came from and, and uh, where it, uh, when it came from. There's another tool called Google Advanced Image Search. And what Google Advanced Image Search is, it's very similar to Google Advanced Search, but it's just for photos. So if I wanted to find information about a particular image, I can search by size, I can search by aspect ratio, I can search by color. So if I wanted to find examples of red cars or blue umbrellas, uh, if I wanted to find historical imagery, what color photo would I search for? Anyone? Historical imagery, old photos, you're a photographer. <laughs> Black and white, yes, very good. Black and white images. Uh, transparent, if I wanted to find a logo with a transparent background or an alpha channel so I can overlay that over top of my graphic, uh, that would be what I would use that for, transparent. I can also search by type, so is it PNG, is it a JPEG, is it a RAW file, if for some reason somebody's uploading RAW files. Uh, I can search by region, by site or domain, there's safe search, and then again down below, usage rights, not filtered by license, free to use or share, or free to use or share even commercially. Now just one quick note, and this kind of ties into what that young lady was asking about before, sometimes you do a search, it's providing results that aren't exactly accurate, uh, or you know, you get a, uh, an image, how do you know for sure that that image is in fact copyright free? How does Google know that? Uh, well, where it's pulling that information from is the description of that image 
It's also pulling it from the metadata that's been embedded within the image. So when you take a photo with a camera, it's taking that image and it's looking at what other data is applied to that. Uh, when you take it into an editing program, additional metadata is included with that image as well. So if I'm a photographer, or if I have a smartphone and I'm uploading my images, what I might want to do is make sure that that image has my metadata correct. So it has my website, it has my copyright information, and has a bunch of additional resources so that someone who's downloading that photo can find that image, find me, and make sure that it's validated, right? Um, now, there's nothing stopping somebody from taking that image, downloading it, changing the title, changing the metadata, and then re-uploading it and saying it's theirs. We live in a digital world, right? So there's limitations to uh, what we can do as Google to make sure that those images are val is valid. But using that tool that we were mentioning before, you can take an image, double check to make sure that it is in fact copyright free by seeing where else online it showed up, find the earliest example of that photo, and that will at least get you most of the way there to be able to validate that photo. One other thing that I want to show you too, down here below in the left-hand corner, uh, it's going to show you examples of uh, pages that are similar to or linked to a specific URL as well. So if you want to find what relationship this particular site has to other sites, you can do that. You can also search for pages that you've already visited before. And there's a lot of other search modifiers that are uh, available down below. So if you haven't checked this out, definitely check it out. Uh, it's a very powerful tool that I don't think a lot of people know about. Now, if you want to find more information about uh, search, if you want to know how Google search works, um, if you go to google.com slash inside search, uh, this is another website that goes in great depth and detail explaining how search works and what really happens behind the scenes when you do a search. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, a, a large amount of additional tips and tricks which are already uh, made available there as well. So everything that we're talking about today is included within that site. If you go to the google.com slash media tool site, it also links to the site as well. So if there's one website you remember today, it's google.com slash media tools. All of these resources are located on that. Uh, but then also, power searching with google.com. Uh, this gentleman, his name is Dr. Dan Russell. Uh, and what Dr. Dan Russell does, he's a search scientist, and he's created two self-paced courses to take you through step-by-step -step how to use Google search as a professional. Um, I was not born a prof uh, like a search guru. Uh, I spent a lot of time with the products. I learned how to use them, and I took this course. They take about a half hour each, roughly. Uh, so on your lunch break or when you have a moment, check these out. They'll do a, it'll give you a lot more additional information about how to use these products. Okay, so this brings me to another product called Google Trends. Have you guys seen Google Trends before? Yeah. Uh, Google Trends, I think this is, again, another really useful tool that you can use in a couple different ways. Um, I like to think of Google Trends as really putting your finger on the pulse of what people are searching for. And again, if you think about your own search activity, something happens in the real world, te people tend to go online and then search for more information about that. So Google Trends is really a snapshot look at what the world is searching for at any given time. And I'm just going to bounce out here for a second. If you go to Google Trends, uh, you have three different sections here uh, which Google Trends is broken into. And actually here, there we go. Uh, there's three different categories that this is broken into. Uh, trending now, top charts, and explore in depth. And this can be used in a few different ways. First, if you just want to get an idea of what people are interested in and searching for around any particular day, let's say you're just not sure what to write a story about, uh, Google Trends could be a really good way to figure out what people are interested in and what's going on in the world. Uh, the Trending Now section, if you click on this, uh, it breaks down for you day by day the top 10 or so top searches for any particular area. You can narrow this down by specific regions. So if I just wanted to look within Italy, I can do that. Or I can look within Canada or uh, I think it's like something like 47 different countries. Um, depending on where you're at in the world, this information will be more or less current. So the closer you are to ca California and Mountain View, the more current the content is. So if you're in Italy, unfortunately, you're going to be about 13 or 14 hours behind. But if you're in New York, it's something like 28 minutes behind. So it just kind of depends on where you're at. If you want like super uh, current results, you can go to the United States here. Uh, and it shows 35 minutes ago. So again, it just depends on how close you are to uh, California. Uh, but let's say we want to look within Italy here. 
It's going to show you the top 10 or so top results. You can immediately share these with uh, your uh, followers if you want to. Uh, you can click on one of the URLs down here. It's going to bring up a news article to tell you a little bit more about this particular topic. If I wanted to find more information about this particular issue, I can also hit the URL here, and it's going to show me a search uh, page to find more information about this. So it becomes a very useful research tool. It's also going to show me, relatively speaking, how many people, uh, what search volume has been uh, done around this particular topic. Um, it also gives me the ability to embed. So I can embed this entire hot searches page right within my news article if I want to. So if you're doing a topic around trending issues, uh, this is a really easy way to embed that. You can control how many items are actually showing up within the page if I want to. Uh, if I have a certain number of pixels to work within, it's creating a widget here which makes it very easy to share. I can also uh, break this down over an entire month. So if I wanted to see across an entire month what was trending, this is a really good idea of uh, kind of looking back in time a bit and seeing over in a course of an entire month what was going on. There, also, you can uh, embed this one as well. So if I wanted to embed this within my site, you can also subscribe to this as well. So if I was actually logged in and hit the subscribe button, I will get these alerts in my inbox on a daily basis or a weekly basis to give me more information. So again, as a research tool, what I would do, and actually what I do have, is I have these going right to my inbox. So every day I get the top 10 or so top trending topics around a particular issue. Top charts is another feature which allows you to uh, break this down by specific categories. So let's say I'm a journalist and I'm working just within the business uh, uh, world, or let's say I'm just interested in cinema, let's say I'm just interested in uh, the Pope, uh, for example, or top trending issues here. I can narrow these down by specific uh, types of categories. I can also go and look at the trending topics here. So this is uh, issues that have started to create a large amount of search volume all of a sudden, more than normal. I can also look uh, at most searched for over here as well. So sometimes you'll get a little icon here uh, telling you different information about a particular topic. Now I'm just going to go to global here real quick and I just want to show you one other thing. So if I scroll down here to the bottom, it's also showing me top trending YouTube videos. So if I want to get a me? snapshot Excuse of me? what... Huh? Sorry, sorry, didn't want to interrupt you, but I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, is it possible to download uh, the trends results as an XLS or as a CSV? Unfortunately not, not at this time. So you do Why? have to do it rather, ma uh, rather manually. Uh, the only really way to do that, and actually I'll show you an example in just a second of how somebody did, well I'll show it to you right now actually. So. Uh, this uh, is 538.com. You don't have to stay just within the Google Trends uh, results. You can actually take that data and then reapply that uh, in another in infographic. So this is Google Trends results. They sourced it down here, uh, Google Trends, uh, and then they just took those numbers and dropped those into a different infographic. Here's another way of looking at it. So this one is a similar thing. They were looking at sports. They took the Google Trends results, they look, uh, took a look at relative size of TV market, and then created a ratio based off of that. But YouTube videos, you can also see what trending YouTube videos are, there are. YouTube, it's the second largest search engine next to Google. It also happens to be owned by Google, so that's really helpful. Uh, but you can get an idea of what people are searching for. Sometimes people are just going online and searching for videos, uh, especially the younger crowd. Uh, Explore is another feature, and what Explore allows you to do is narrow by a specific region. So I can actually narrow this down very, very tightly. So if I wanted to look within Italy, I just wanted to look within a specific region of Italy. I can look within a specific date range, so just the set last seven days, 30, 90, or 12 months. I can also look within a specific year or a specific date range. Uh, I can look within specific categories, and these are broken down into all, all sorts of different buckets. I can also search by different types of searches. So is it an image search? Is it a Google News search? Is it a web search? And this, uh, this tool is actually really useful in a few different ways. So here's an example. This was, uh, we were just playing around with this uh, a couple days ago when we were in Rome. Uh, there was the, uh, uh, the canonization of two different popes that were going on. You may have heard a little bit about this. Uh, this was going on. So we did a few different searches to see what people were searching for around this particular topic. And you can also see where these particular topics are trending the, the, the most. So in this case, oddly, a lot more search traffic in Peru than in Italy for these particular terms. 
sometimes you'll also get a, a map uh, that shows up right here, uh, which will show you uh, where in a particular region on a map where people are actually uh, searching for things. Uh, and then over here, <laughs> this is actually kind of funny, uh, the, uh, in relationship to the Pope, looks like Papa John's is actually one of the most popular search topics here. So there's a little bit of a difference in translation uh, for that particular search term, but then also uh, the Pope, uh, Pope John Paul, and so on. Uh, and then over here, these are other search queries which are related to this particular search. So if I wanted to get an idea of what people are going to be talking about tomorrow, perhaps, I would take a look at this rising search and then pay attention to these search terms to make sure that I'm looking for the right information. Another way of looking at this tool is when you're creating headlines, uh, when you're thinking about search engine optimization, and when you're thinking about creating your articles in a way that your search engines can find your articles very easily, so that when someone goes online and they type words into the search bar, making sure that you're using the correct words is really, really important. Uh, I have an example. So when you, uh, for example, we were looking here at Malaysia Airlines. This is a uh, Wall Street Journal in Asia. I did an article on this. And unfortunately, this particular search result, and actually maybe I could pull it up here. Yep. So in this case, uh, people were searching for MH307, not MH370, uh, in relationship to this particular disaster. And as you can see, there's like this huge spike for MH370. MH307 was less so, but if I eliminate that, you can actually see that there was a lot of people that were going online and typing the wrong airline number into the search bar when searching for this particular topic. So having an understanding of search behavior and how people are approaching a particular story is really important. Now, I wouldn't necessarily change your headline and make it MH307, right? But maybe somewhere within the description, I would po possibly put in other people have been searching for MH307 in addition to MH370. Here's another example. Actually, also in Malaysia, I was there a few months ago. Uh, we were talking to a ladies' uh, fashion magazine, and in Bahasa, uh, in Malaysia, there's two different words for the word for woman. There's the more formal version of the word, and there's a more casual version of the word. And this women's fashion magazine was using the more formal version of the word in their headlines and in the descriptions of all of their articles. And what it turns out, and they, they're asking us, you know, we're using uh, Google, we're doing all, all these things correctly. Uh, our competitors' newspaper articles are showing up more readily within search results than ours. What are we doing wrong? Well, you know, we took a look at Google Trends a little bit, and it turns out that the people who are searching for women's fashion or women's clothing or women's entertainment, they're using the more casual version of the word in Bahasa. So again, having an understanding of your audience and having an understanding of how that they're looking for particular topics is really important. Uh, Google Trends is one way of doing that. Also, just to mention, okay, and again, here's like the, uh, the regional interest that I was showing you earlier. This is an animated graph that you can actually uh, move over time. So as time goes on, this particular search region will light up depending on where that story is going. Now, each one of these modules you can embed within your uh, news piece. So if I wanted to embed the map, if I wanted to embed uh, the specific regions that these were, uh, searches were being done in, uh, if I wanted to search uh, the related searches and embed those within my, uh, my article, each one of these modules is separately embeddable. And again, as I mentioned before, you don't have to stay within that particular Google Trends page. You can strip that data out, and you can actually apply that within another infographic. The only thing that we ask is just that you source Google Trends somewhere here in the description or within the infographic itself, uh, and that should be fine. Does anybody have any questions on that for now? All right. So one other product that we'll talk about here is called Google Public Data. Uh, for those of you who have not seen Google Public Data, it is a basically a library of data sources. So remember how we were mentioning before about triggers, and I typed in population. Uh, let's say I went to population in Ireland, and then I did file type XLS. This is one way to find data sets uh, so that I can then take those, download those, and use those for my particular uh, topic. But, but let's say, for example, I wanted to, um, where'd it go? There it is. Uh, let's say I wanted more information or more data that was available. Google Public Data is this library of data sources. And there's literally hundreds of different data sets that are available within this particular product. Uh, they're available in multiple languages. So if I just wanted to look within Italian, 
Um, I can search for specific data sets that have been translated into Italian. Now each one of these data sets are actually coming from a third party data provider. So it might be the World Bank, it might be IMF, uh, Eurostat for example. Um, depending on what language you're using, there may be uh, fewer or more uh, data sets available. Not all of them have been translated into all languages. So if you want the most available data sets possible, I would start in English and then move on from there. Uh, but you can search by different languages. When you first go to Google Public Data, it's going to show you results or examples of data sets that have been created um, by other people. So if you want to get an idea of what you can do with this particular tool, you can just click on these different examples here. If I wanted to see uh, this particular example, I can hit explore this data and it's going to show me examples uh, of this particular data set uh, that I can then play around with. If I wanted to create my own data set, however, um, I could do this a couple different ways. You can, and again, to use that metaphor of a library, I can go into the library, I can pull books down off the shelf, and I can page through them to find out what's in them. And that would be the equivalent of clicking on one of these data sets and going through that. Or I can just ask the librarian for more information. So let's say I wanted to find information on a gross domestic product, for example. I can search by GDP and it's going to show me what uh, data sets have information on GDP in them. Uh, another way of doing this would just be to go to a particular data set. Let's say you're familiar with the data set. Some of these data sets come out once a year. Some come out once every six months. Some come out once a month. It just depends on the data set and what kind of data provider it is. But let's say, for example, I wanted to explore this particular data set. I can hit explore this data and at first it's going to show up blank because I haven't selected anything. Uh, I'm looking within just the World Bank. It's going to show me down at the bottom here always where the data set came from and how recent it was uploaded. So if I wanted to go through here and take a look at the World Bank information, uh, it's going to tell me over here what information I need. So in this case, it's saying this chart needs more information. Choose some data for the YS. So from this drop-down menu, I'm going to select different indicators. So let's say I want to take a look at uh, internet users as a percentage of population. So this is a pretty compelling uh, data visualization. It looks like right around 1996 or so, there was this huge uptick in uh, internet usage uh, by population. Even in 2012, though, we're still only at about 35% of the entire world has internet access, uh, which is pretty amazing. You would think that there would be more. So we're still working on getting the other 5 million or so people online. Uh, but let's say I wanted to narrow that even further and I wanted to look within Asia or, or um, Europe, for example. I'm going to look at Italy. Uh, I'll pick a few other ones. Let's say Greece, you know, France, okay, Ukraine. Where else? Anyone else? Where? Thailand. That would not be in Latin. That would be down here, Southeast Asia. Nope. Where is Thailand? I just clicked on that, it's not there. Maybe up here. Oh, here we go, East Asia. Geography. There we go. There we go, Thailand. Uh, we'll look at the US too. So North America, and there we go. So we have a really quick data visualization. It looks like the France and the US are leading right now, 83% uh, and 81%. Italy is not far behind with 58%, Greece 56%, and Thailand's all the way down here at 26.5, um, which is interesting. Now, what I can do then further than that is I can narrow this particular date range. So obviously it's not really going to help me to look anything but before 1990 because the internet really wasn't around before then. So I'm going to narrow this to 1990 to give me more information around the specific date range. If I wanted to click and drag this particular date range around, I can narrow this as well which I think creates an even more compelling look at internet usage. So, you know, starting at around 1990, the U.S. kind of like was leading the pack here for a little bit. Now, this is an interesting data visualization, but maybe the line graph really isn't the best way of going about doing this. Whenever you're doing a data visualization or an infographic, really what you want to do is making sh you want to make sure that the information is easy to understand for your reader. You don't want to further confuse them with the information that you're providing. So in this case, maybe a bar graph might be more useful. Now, the good thing about these bar graphs is you can click and drag through this date range and it's actually going to play through and animate this by hitting this little play icon right here. 
So again, as a way to catch someone's eye or catch someone's attention when you're embedding this within your article, sometimes an animation does a really great job of telling a story more so than a static graph. You could take a still shot of this, uh, but really providing the information in a way for your readers to be able to interact with, I think is the better way of going. Uh, so in this case, I can uh, select a URL up here or select the HTML embed code and embed this directly within my article. And if I do that, it's going to show up very much like those examples that I was showing you earlier. Now, I just want to show you one other thing, and maybe this will make everybody feel a little bit better. So uh, we'll look at CO2 emissions per capita. So if I clicked on, we'll go back to that line chart again. So this is internet usage, where France and the United States are way up here. Let's look at uh, CO2 emissions per capita. So unfortunately, I have to, uh, have to announce that the, the United States, as well as uh, leading in internet, is also leading in CO2 emissions. So on behalf of my country, I apologize for that. Uh, we're working on that. Uh, but you can see here, too, that the Ukraine, there's no information before 1992 here. So if you see a line that kind of starts in the middle of nowhere, that just means on this particular data graph or this particular data set, there's no information before that particular date. So you could look at another data set, perhaps, and compare those across one another uh, to get more information. And again, you can narrow this by different uh, types of visualizations. There's multiple different ones uh, that you can do here. In each one of these, you can embed directly within your article. Now, I'll just show you one other feature within this. Let's say, for example, you've created your own data set. You have a spreadsheet. You've collected addresses. You've collected, collected names. Let's say you've collected data of any kind of type. You can upload that data set using the My Data Sets feature here. And if you're logged in, it'll allow you to upload that data set. It'll temporarily store that in Google Drive. And then you can take that. You can actually embed that as well using this exact same feature. Uh, so you don't have to just rely on data sets that are available down here. You can pull data sets from other sources or ones that you created yourself and use the My Data Sets feature to help visualize that. And when you embed them in your article, this is very similar to what they will look like. Does anybody have any questions on Google public data? Yeah, so it's not going to be publicly made available. That's a good question. They're not going to be publicly made available. Uh, you're just using the infrastructure of Google public data in order to help visualize your data set. The only way it would become uh, publicly available is if you actually made that data set available as a PDF or an XLS format. Uh, that's why when you, uh, when you hit my data sets, it actually asks you to sign in because it's saving it temporarily within your Google Drive folder. Um, and unless you share that document, it's not publicly available yet. Anybody else have any other questions on Google public data? All right. So, oh, I just wanted to mention as well, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, Google Trends is also available. I'll get. I'll sure. Yeah, so um, with Google Public Data in particular, you can do a screenshot of that graph if you want. With most things, uh, Google, uh, making sure that you have somewhere within that uh, attribution saying where you got the data from will probably keep you at a... Exactly, yeah, just making sure that you've attributed it somewhere to it. Um, again, though, I would recommend, especially with Google Public Data, because it's such an interactive component, I would provide those as a URL or provide that as an HTML embed so people can actually uh, play around with it, as opposed to it being a static graph. Um, I think especially nowadays with social media and with the web, uh, it's all about engagement and interactivity. So the more opportunities you're giving your reader to experiment with or play with that data, I think the more validity it le lends to your own arguments or in your own article. Yeah, but to your question, yeah, as long as you have attribution there, if you've done a full screenshot, you should be fine. If you ever have any questions about um, uh, permissions, uh, I need two hands. If you ever have any questions about attribution or how to use a particular tool without getting into trouble from an angry Googler, uh, you know, making sure that you're using uh, these different permissions correctly, just go to google.com slash permissions. It breaks down everything you could possibly ever need to know about these various products. If you ever have a question about any of them, you just email us, mediatools at google.com. 
give us examples. The more details, the better. So if you give us a URL, a screenshot, a little description of what you're trying to do, uh, we could take a look at that and kind of give you a little bit more information about it. Yeah, my pleasure. So just wanted to mention as well, within Google Trends, this is also available on mobile as well. So if you're using a mobile phone or if you're using a tablet, um, you don't have to worry about um, it being a weird format. Not all tools work well uh, on mobile, but Google Public Data specifically is formatted for that. Uh, this is the website that I was talking about earlier, google.com slash media tools. Everything that we talked about just now is under this section called Gather and Organize, and we just kind of scratched the surface of uh, the information that's available there. So there's a lot more resource, resources and information that are uh, available. Uh, later on today, we'll be talking about the Engage section, about YouTube and Google+, and how you can use that as a way to help amplify your signal or find more people uh, to pay attention to what you're working on. Uh, well, I thought I had a link to our uh, Google Plus page, but I guess I don't. Uh, if you go to uh, our Google Plus page as well, we can uh, within Google Plus, uh, the Google for Media team has a Google Plus page as well. It's Plus Google for Media. Uh, we have a lot of tips and tricks and other examples of uh, people around the world, journalists who have been using our products. So if you want to really get a good idea of what you can do with these products, check those out. But again, stay in touch with us. This is our email address, mediatools at google.com. This is the website, google.com slash mediatools. You can reach me at Google Plus or on Twitter at Nick Digital. If you ever have any questions or if you want more information or if you want some more educational resources, that's what we're here for. We're an education and advocacy group. We're really here to teach you. And um, what we really, really enjoy is when journalists get in touch with us and they have questions, they have examples of uh, things that you've done with our products. Um, stay in touch with us. You know, that's really what we're here for. And I can't stress that enough. You know, make sure you stay in touch. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we end for the day? Is everybody a Google expert now? <laughs> yeah? Uh, like I said before, if you want the homework uh, that I'll be sending around, just email me at mediatools at google.com and just say, this was a fantastic presentation. I could not learn enough. I want more information. I will send that to you. Uh, and if at any time you have questions or you want more information, you can always reach us at that email address. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you.